Welcome to this episode of the weekly News Roundup. At least 20 people have died and more than 55 lakh people have been affected in Bangladesh by floods caused by relentless monsoon rains and overflowing rivers, officials said. The floodwaters have left many people isolated and in urgent need of food, clean water, medicine and dry clothes, particularly in remote areas where blocked roads have hampered rescue and relief efforts. Government Chief Advisor Mohammad Yunus, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, is leading the interim government that was sworn in after former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina fled the country following a violent student uprising this month. Mr. Yunus said in a televised address that the administration has adopted all necessary measures to ensure a swift return to normalcy for flood victims. Some people in Bangladesh have alleged that the floods were caused by the opening of damp sluice gates in neighbouring India, an assertion New Delhi has rejected. We have begun discussions with neighbouring countries to prevent future flood situations, Yunus said. The Bangladesh Meteorological Department has warned that flood conditions could persist if the monsoon rains continue as water levels are receding very slowly. More than 400,000 people have taken refuge in around 3,500 shelters in the 11 flood-hit districts where nearly 750 medical teams are on the ground to provide treatment with the Army, Air Force, Navy and Border Security Bangladesh assisting in rescue operations, authorities said. An analysis in 2015 by the World Bank Institute estimated that 3.5 million people in Bangladesh, one of the world's most climate vulnerable countries, were at risk of annual river flooding. Scientists attribute the exacerbation of such catastrophic events to climate change. We bring you this report. Rescue teams, including Joint Forces of the Army, Air Force and Navy, are helping people forced from their homes and bringing aid to those who have lost everything, Disaster Management Minister Farooq A. Azam said. The flood situation is improving as the flood waters start to recede, he said. More than 3 lakh people are in shelters and more than 5 lakh people have been affected by the floods, the ministry said. Now, we are working to restore communication in the affected areas so that we can distribute relief food, Azam said. We are also taking steps so that contagious diseases don't spread. People in Bangladesh have been crowdfunding relief efforts. The floods add to the woes of a nation still reeling from weeks of political turmoil after former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina fled the country after days of student protests. Bangladesh is home to around 17 crore people and is among the countries most vulnerable to disasters and climate change, according to the Global Climate Risk Index. Hard-hit areas include the southeastern regions around Chittagong and Cox's Bazar, home to about a million Rohingya refugees from neighbouring Myanmar. It was officially confirmed that at least 20 people have lost their lives, including a pregnant woman who was swept away by fast-running waters. The ministry reports that 3,160 shelters have been set up by the government in response to the crisis. The floods have devastated eastern Bangladesh at the same time the country is going through political turmoil. The regions of Feni and Kumula were worst hit, the country's Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief said. Communication lines have been affected, with almost all cell phone towers losing electricity. Rail service has been suspended and roads have been damaged, hampering delivery of emergency aid. Bangladesh's army and navy have been deployed for rescue operations. Residents described water levels beyond any they had seen in recent years. An interim government led by the Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus, which includes representatives of the protesters, is trying to restore order to what was a dangerous and violent vacuum. The natural disaster adds to the government's long list of challenges, including discredited law enforcement, an economy in a downward spiral, and a banking sector on the verge of collapse. 
People surrounded the country's water management body, protesting the government's slow response and demanding that speed boats and rescue boats be sent to the flooded regions. The floods have also increased tensions with neighboring India. Members of the interim government have accused India, which is upstream of Bangladesh, of opening dam gates without warning. India was a close backer of Ms. Hasina and is sheltering her, so relations between the two countries are already fraught. The Indian government has rejected claims that it opened the dam gates in Tripura, an Indian state that borders Bangladesh. India said, flooding because of heavy rain has been a problem on both sides of the border and that the damage in Bangladesh was caused primarily by water from catchments downstream of the dam in question. Bangladesh's low-lying geography means floods caused by monsoon rains and cyclones are common. Recent encroachment and infrastructure development have also affected the natural flow of the rivers and made them more likely to overflow. In May this year, Cyclone Ramal caused devastation, killing over a dozen people in Bangladesh. Last year in May, Cyclone Mocha also caused widespread damage, leaving thousands homeless, including Rohingya Muslims seeking refuge in Cox's Bazar after fleeing persecution in Myanmar. Meanwhile, Chief Advisor of the Interim Government in Bangladesh, Muhammad Yunus, warned that health and food risks may arise once flood waters recede and urge the people to unite in the relief work with encouragement from the youth. The Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Border Guard of Bangladesh, Fire Service, Civil Defence and Students' Community in coordination with District Administration are making rescue efforts in the flood-hit areas all over, the Ministry said. During a meeting with about 44 NGOs, Eunice urged the country's people to come forward to address the ongoing devastating flood. With the flood waters starting to recede, waterborne diseases and health-related issues would emerge and the meeting discussed how these issues can be addressed. In latest news coming in, hundreds of Indian students are protesting against changes in Canada's immigration policy over fears that they will be deported. Students are demanding an extension of work permits and a clear path to permanent residency. The policy changes have had a severe impact on these students. Many of them who intended to apply for permanent residency after completing their studies are now burdened with significant debt and broken dreams. The students in Canada have taken to the streets to protest recent changes to the country's immigration policies, fearing deportation. In addition, over 70,000 international students across Canada have mobilized in large numbers against the federal policy changes. Many of these students who arrived with hopes of building new lives are now expressing their frustration on the streets. The students fear that their work permits, which will expire at the end of the year, might not be renewed, which has increased the risk of deportation of the students. We bring you this report. The policy changes have had a severe impact on these students. Many who intended to apply for permanent residency after completing their studies are now burdened with significant debt and broken dreams. This follows a policy announced by the Canadian government in January, which would cut the number of new international student permits by 35% from the 2023 number, effective September 1, 2024. In May, the government said that beginning September, international students would only be able to work off campus for a maximum of 24 hours per week. Many former international students facing deportation expressed their dismay saying, We spent the most crucial six years of our lives taking many risks to come to Canada. We studied, we worked, we paid taxes. We earned enough CRS, which is the Comprehensive Ranking System points. But the government has just taken advantage of us. 
A group of students on Tuesday set up encampments outside the Legislative Assembly in Prince Edward Island, protesting overnight for more than three months. Similar demonstrations were witnessed in Ontario, Manitoba and British Columbia, media reports stated. On Monday, the Canadian government announced that it will significantly reduce the number of temporary foreign workers it accepts, reversing expansions made in 2022. This decision comes as Justin Trudeau's government grapples with rising concerns about the number of temporary residents. Canadian PM Trudeau's cabinet is also considering cuts to permanent residency streams. He recently said, We're looking at the various streams to make sure that as we move forward, Canada remains a place that is positive in its support for immigration, but also responsible in the way we integrate and make sure there are pathways to success for everyone who comes to Canada. The International Sikh Student Organization said such problems are rooted in broader policy failures rather than migration of international students. The advocacy groups and students are calling on the federal government to extend work permits and provide clear pathways to permanent residency, emphasizing that they contribute significantly to the Canadian economy and deserve fair treatment, according to the report. Since the beginning of the Israel-Hamas conflict, the Hezbollah in Lebanon has always supported Hamas's cause and has constantly attacked northern Israel, which shares a border with Lebanon, with drones and missiles. There have been regular cross-border attacks between Israel and Lebanon. On 30th July, Fuad Shukra, a very senior Hezbollah commander, was assassinated in a targeted airstrike in Beirut. Shukra was among the founding members of Hezbollah during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. He was part of the generation of Lebanese Shiites who aligned with Iran's revolutionary guards to establish the group. The United States also accused Shukra of playing a central role in the 1983 bombing of the US Marine Barracks in Beirut which killed 241 US military personnel. The US government had placed a bounty of up to 5 million US dollars on Shukra's head through its Rewards for Justice program. Fuad Shukra was also a special advisor to Hezbollah's leader Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah and was a member of the Shura Council, a key decision-making body within the organization. His killing was a big setback for Hezbollah. In the early hours of Sunday, the 25th of this month, close to a month since Fuad Shukar's assassination, Israeli jets attacked southern Lebanon, saying it was a preemptive strike against Hezbollah rocket launchers that were preparing to attack Israel. Hundreds of Hezbollah rocket launchers, each with dozens of launch barrels, along with numerous drones, were struck simultaneously by the fighter jets in the preemptive attacks, the military said. We bring you this report. While central Israel, including Tel Aviv, was in the terror group's crosshairs, the majority of the Hezbollah rocket launchers struck by the Israeli Air Force were aimed at the north according to the IDF. The strikes did not prevent the Iran-backed terror organization from beginning what it said was its response to the killing of its military commander Fuad Shukr in Israeli airstrike on Beirut last month. When Hezbollah claiming it fired over 320 rockets and drones at northern Israel. In a televised speech, Hassan Nasrallah of Hezbollah also insisted that the Israelis had not uncovered the attack and rejected Israeli claims that its military had destroyed the Lebanese group's rocket launchers. The Israel's Defense Forces said it had identified overnight preparations in Hezbollah's rocket array for a major and immediate attack on Israel. Fighter jets began to remove the threat shortly before 5 a.m. Hezbollah said it fired more than 320 rockets at northern Israel early Sunday morning, along with several explosive-laden drones. The launches came after the IDF strikes. In a statement, Hezbollah claimed to have targeted 11 military bases in northern Israel. 
The Israeli military's home front command, meanwhile, issued restrictions on the public from the Tel Aviv area and northward after Defense Minister Gallant declared an emergency situation known as a special situation on the home front nationwide for 48 hours amid the escalation. A special situation is a legal term used in times of emergency granting authorities greater jurisdiction over the civilian population to streamline efforts to safeguard the population. Fuad Shukr, the head of Hezbollah's military wing, was killed in his Beirut apartment by an Israeli airstrike in July and the country has since been bracing for a response by the terrorist organization. Since the 8th of October, Hezbollah-led forces have attacked Israeli communities and military posts along the border on a near daily basis, with the group saying it is doing so to support Gaza amid the war against Hamas there. So far, the skirmishes on the northern border have resulted in 26 civilian deaths on the Israeli side, as well as the deaths of 19 IDF soldiers and reservists. There have also been several attacks from Syria without any injuries. Hezbollah has named 428 members who have been killed by Israel during the ongoing skirmishes mostly in Lebanon, but some also in Syria. In Lebanon, another 73 operatives from other terror groups, a Lebanese soldier and dozens of civilians have been killed. The entire region is still tense now, waiting for the next attack. It remains to be seen what the Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas group is planning next. The Paris 2024 Olympic Games came to a close on August 11th. The report we have for you is of the many athletes who shone in the Paris Olympics, not only for their great achievements on the track and field, but also for their faith in God. Reminding the world, especially in secularized France, that the greatest and most important crown is that of eternal life. We bring you this report. American sprinter Noah Lyles, who won the gold medal in the men's 100-meter dash, told Premier Christian Radio. Nicola, a 27-year-old Australian high jumper who won a silver medal, is also known for her Christian faith and is co-founder of the Everlasting Crowns Ministry, which seeks to see fellow athletes transformed by the perfect love of Jesus. She wrote on her Instagram account in a post with a video showing her participation in Paris 2024. You are chosen, loved and given more than you need to do exactly what you are called to do. U.S. track star Sydney. I, I credit all that I do to God. I, he's given me a gift. He's given me a drive to uh, just want to continue to improve upon myself. And I have a platform and I want to use it to glorify him. And so whenever I step on the track, it's always the prayer of God. Let me be the vessel in which you're glorified, whatever the result is. Um, <clears throat> how I conduct myself, how I carry myself, not just how I perform. And so it's just freedom in knowing that regardless of what happens, he's going to get the praise um, through me. And yeah, that's why I do what I do. We now bring to you the amazing and truly inspiring story of Reverend Father James Cottail SJ, the first missionary martyr priest of India. Father James belonged to the Society of Jesus Congregation, or the Jesuits, as they are known all over the world. Father James Cottail was born on the 15th of November 1915 at Turti Palli near Kadaturti in the Diocese of Palai in Kerala. He was the third child of Chako and Mariam Cottail. They were both God-fearing Catholics noted for their generosity and concern for the poor and the needy. The young James was well instructed by his parents in Christian values and practices. Like most Syro Malabar Catholic families of those times in Kerala, his parents paid special attention to bringing him up in deep faith and good character. At the age of 21, on the 26th of April 1936, he entered the Society of Jesus in the province of Ranchi in the Chota Nagpur mission. After the long and highly disciplined 
Jesuit training on the 1st of November on All Saints Day in 1948. He was ordained a priest and he made his final profession on 15th August 1952. We bring you this report. Father James's first appointment was to be the assistant parish priest at Jashpur. Because he chose to work with the poor and the marginalized of the society, he himself chose to serve in rural missions rather than in towns and cities. Thereafter, Father himself volunteered for the remote village parish of Nawatad. When Father James reached this remote mission village, there was only a lower primary school for the children and a small shed for the pastor. There he lived and went around the villages and brought small children to school and educated them. Father James put his heart and soul into the development of the poor people of the area. He also started small self-help groups to save the lives of bonded laborers who literally lived like slaves. Furthermore, he also used his technical know-how and experience to teach the poor tribal Adivasis to save their hard-earned money through small savings schemes. This was strongly opposed by the heartless moneylenders and landlords of the area. Naturally, in course of time, there was strong animosity against him. The ruthless moneylenders and those owning the bonded labourers wanted to eliminate him. He was becoming a nuisance to them. On the 13th of July 1967 at 9 p.m., a few people came to Father James and asked him for water and overnight stay in the premises. Father most willingly accommodated them in the compound. After an hour, they knocked at the door of Father's room. Little did Father know that they were professional contract killers. When Father opened the door, they stabbed him with a knife. They stabbed him continuously 13 times. Hearing father's great cry of agony, the villagers came rushing out and took him by bullock cart to the Holy Family Hospital in Mandar. Although the best possible medical care was given by the medical staff of the Medical Mission Sisters in their hospital, the damage done to his body was so great and extensive that his life was in critical danger. Three days later, on the 16th of July, after receiving blessings from his provincial superior and forgiving all the murderers and praying for the Ranchi mission, he was called to his eternal rest. Father James lived the simple and humble life of a Jesuit missionary. Yet, he became the target of heartless moneylenders and landlords. A martyr is punished not because he or she does anything wrong, but precisely because he or she does the right thing by bearing witness to our Lord Jesus Christ. Father James Cotail was one such martyr and the price he paid for his faith was with his life. Thanks so much for watching. Until we meet next time, stay blessed.